Greetings, I'm Dr. Gayathri Acharya, Cardiology Fellow at Mayo Clinic. During today's recording, we'll be discussing the link between diet and cardiovascular health. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Steve Kopetsky and Dr. Robert France, who are experts in this area. Welcome. Thank Thanks. you. Good to be here. Great to have you. Dr. Kopetsky, can you describe for us the historical context and the epidemiology of this discussion between diet and cardiovascular health? Yes, it's very interesting. It really started with Ansel Keys over five decades ago, where they looked at the Seven Nations study around mainly around Europe and some in the U.S. and showed that there was evidence that eating a high saturated fat diet increased cardiovascular mortality. Now, at the time, some of the Mediterranean nations, the Greece and Italy, some of the investigators there said, don't forget about the monounsaturated fats we're eating a lot of here, because most people at that time around the world did not eat olive oil. In fact, in Britain and the U.S., we ate maybe an ounce a day. In comparison now, it's very little. So that's where the saturated fat idea got started, and it really has been very hard to lose that over the years. Dr. Franz, any additional comments? For me, this whole area is both personal and professional in the sense that I really grew up um, in a family where my father was a lipid researcher and made his career in that area. And so I've kind of lived this, and I, I suppose maybe some of, some of my credibility in this area to the extent that I have it has to do with the fact that the, my mother lived to 98 and my father into his 90s. And, and so whatever they were doing seemed to sort of work. But I remember from a young age growing up with, with my father talking about this concept of people who came to the United States, adopted a Western diet, and then lo and behold, their cardiovascular risk went up in a way that was very different from their origins and seemed to reflect in some sense the dietary habits that they picked up by coming uh, to the Western society. And so that whole connection between diet and particularly what types of things are in our diet in terms of fat and so forth is something that I heard about from the day that I could remember anything in this world. And Dr. France, you mentioned your father, Dr. Ivan France, um, and his project on the Minnesota Coronary Experiment. Can you tell us about, a bit more about that? Right. So in the late 1960s and 70s, there was a lot of interest in this idea of whether we could translate the findings from animal models uh, of being able to lower uh, cholesterol through a diet that was low in saturated fat could that be translated into the societal gains in terms of cardiovascular risk? And so my father did a lot of work early on just separating lipid fractions and understanding HDL and LDL and what these things mean. And then an animal work looking at, at diets that could lower uh, lipid profiles in animal models. And then worked on the Minnesota coronary uh, experiment, which essentially was to translate this into a a large uh, study of uh, diet and trying to reduce cholesterol and reduce cardiovascular risk. So he worked on that project for, for many years and in fact the diet was quite effective in lowering cholesterol and it's actually the largest well-controlled diet study ever done, but in fact was a, a neutral study that did not really demonstrate a significant reduction in risk overall despite the fact that it did effectively lower cholesterol. So I think that was a very disappointing finding and this has come back up again more recently because of work that uh, has been done in conjunction with the Chris, Dr. Chris Ramsden, a researcher at the NIH, who's been interested in the concept of maybe it was partly how the cholesterol was lowered that was a problem. And in fact, those diets that were utilized were high in linoleic acid, which is an, of course an essential uh, amino acid, but essentially is something that is potentially pro-inflammatory when it's heated and, and broken down. And so the concept that came out of the additional analyses was that potentially it was a problem with, with the, a high linoleic acid content diet that may have been pro-inflammatory. So then that gets us to this whole issue that it's not only about saturated fat, but it's also about pro-inflammatory antioxidant effects and other parameters in the diet. Dr. Kopetsky, on that topic, what eating styles do lower cardiovascular death and events? Well, it's interesting. If you look at, um, at the diets that, that have been out there, there really have been three diets that we have names for that have lowered cardiovascular events. 
One is Ornish's, that was one of the early ones, very low fat. The second was the, um, was the DASH diet, which is more fruits and vegetables. And the third is the Mediterranean diet. And the things that uh, these have in common, especially the DASH and the Mediterranean, is more fruits and vegetables, uh, olive oils. Dr. Franz mentioned the, uh, the pro-inflammatory effects that may be present in some of the corn oils and things like that. Olive oil actually has very uh, anti-inflammatory effects. Now, one of the questions I get in clinic all the time from my patients is, should we go high fat, low carb, low, uh, low fat, high carb? Yeah. How do we make sense of this for our patients? Dr. France? Well, to me, I think the, the concept of high glycemic index foods that are yanking our, our insulin levels around and may have both negative effects on our, our cardiovascular system and also may even have effects on our appetite where we're uh, yo-yoing our, our insulin and glucose levels around may actually result in more craving and more hunger later is, is relatively appealing. And uh, so I, I think this concept to me of, of limiting high glycemic index carbohydrates makes good sense. And epidemiologically, it makes sense if you think about the Mediterranean diet and things of that type, which were relatively modest in terms of high glycemic index foods. And so I think that makes a great deal of sense. I mean, I, I think that we, we need to avoid the concept that saturated fat is okay for you in large amounts, because I don't think that's true, you know, in the sense that, that I, I do believe that a, a diet that's low in saturated fat is a healthy diet, but it really is very important in terms of how you replace that saturated fat. And mm -hmm. Dr. Kopeski could probably speak mm -hmm. further to mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I think that's a good point, uh, Bob. And there, there are really two issues, I think. One is, is high carb, low carb that you ask about. And any low carb, high fat diet increases your total mortality and your cardiovascular mortality. If you divide a low carb diet up into two groups, a animal-based low carb versus a plant-based low carb, so you go to the hamburger store, you throw away the bun, but you eat the beef burger. That will actually increase your cardiovascular mortality 20-25% and your total death. Eating a plant-based will lower it significantly. So the key there is eat more plant, less animal. And the other thing that uh, Bob mentioned was this idea of the oils, which is very important. And if you look at processed oils, which we eat a lot of in this country, you know, canola oil and corn oil and these polyunsaturated oils, they actually are pro-inflammatory. And uh, the olive oil is actually anti-inflammatory. So unfortunately in this country, now you know it's a good thing, about 80% of the food we eat in this country is made in this country. About 56% of our calories that we eat in this country is from processed foods. Mainly seven subsidized groups, dairy, livestock, uh, things like corn, uh, soybeans, wheat, a couple of others, soy, uh, sorghum. And those things, if we eat those, and you, have a, a, uh, you track that, that will increase our risk of obesity, increase our risk of heart disease, increase our, our risk of diabetes. And about 56% of our calories are eaten from those processed foods. So the other thing is the processed foods that we need to stay away from. Yeah, I think it's the, the concentration of calories in these processed foods can be quite high. And I, I think one of the advantage of the more plant-based um, diet is that the, the calorie density is just less. So a favorite thing that I do is roast vegetables, right? So, I mean, it's, they're good. They pick up a certain sweetness as they roast, and they're, they're high in fiber. They're varied in terms of their other content, and, and they're relatively low calorie. And you put olive oil on them. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Right. Now, Dr. Kapetsky, another follow-up question is we get asked a lot, well, what about heating olive oil? Are there yeah. other heart-healthy oils that we can cook with? Yeah. Well, a patient asked me that the other day. He says, Doctor, you know, you tell me to eat olive oil, but I, when I fry with it, doesn't it break down? I said, that's the point. Don't eat fried foods. <laughs> you know, you have to use corn oil or canola oil or something like that. So fried foods really just puts all that fat into the, you know, the surface of the food, and we need to avoid that. Absolutely. Now, we hear a lot about some fad diets, most recently the MIND diet for Alzheimer's. Yeah. Can you speak to that a bit? Well, the MIND diet is very clever. It's the Mediterranean and the DASH put together. <laughs> so it's fruits and vegetables, lower sodium, things like that. And it's been shown to reduce Alzheimer's, as has the Mediterranean diet. Reduces Alzheimer's, reduces uh, erectile dysfunction, reduces diabetes, Parkinson's, arthritis, heart attack, stroke, you know, and on and on. So. The Mediterranean is the basis for all of that, I think. 
Now, we talked about fried foods, but another huge food group that's a culprit here would be processed foods. How do we sort out which processed foods we should or should not be eating? Dr. France? Well, to me, I, I, I try to stay away from them, especially if they're quite calorie dense. So a lot of these are, are manufactured and processed in a way that pick up a, a lot of oil, a lot of fat, and, and potentially using oils that when heated may be pro-inflammatory. And so I, I think it's important just to stay away in general from so many of these processed foods to the extent that we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. We, we've done, um, I think, a disservice to our patients, uh, you know, as a profession by trying to say eat certain uh, components. Eat, you know, less saturated fat, more polyunsaturated. I don't understand what that is, you know, but I can understand an apple. <laughs> I can understand a banana. I can understand an almond. I understand fish, you know, things like that. So. If it's, if it's a whole food, eat that. If it's out of a box or out of some sort of a pre-made package, that's what we need to try to stay away from because as Dr. Fran said, they have a lot of oils in them that, and other components that aren't good for us. And to that point, are there any, uh, it, I find that my patients have a challenge sorting through the recommendations that are coming through some really well-established groups for health. Are there any specific recommendations we should guide them towards, Dr. France or Dr. Kopetsky? Well, to me, I, I think that the move towards more plant-based foods and the Mediterranean aspects in terms of nuts, olive oil, and, and looking at fruits in general is potentially, potentially a little bit more neutral, especially the ones that are really going to provide a big um, sugar boost uh, that, that sometimes I'll say, see patients that are trying very hard to do things differently and they're eating a large amount of fruit and depending on what kind of fruit it is it may have a lot of sugar in it and I'm not sure that's actually good for us so yeah. that to me that's that's one aspect yeah I, I try to tell patients to stay away from the tropical fruits if it grows in Minnesota you can eat it you know with the papayas the mangoes the bananas pineapples they, they have a lot of sugar and the uh, the other thing is if if the Mediterranean diet we've actually put together a booklet here that has ten do's and four don'ts three of the ten do's are olive oil based around olive oil. The others are like uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, anything that breaks in half is a legume, you know, a bean like that. Uh, fish, wh uh, white meat, poultry. And try to explain to patients that, that anything that's not uh, light meat, so if it's dark meat, or if it's light meat with the skin on, that's a saturated fat, and they need to stay, they only get a deck of cards of that a day. The other things to avoid are the red meats, which is basically everything else. Uh, if they want protein, get it in you know, some other uh, plant-based or the light meat chicken. Uh, try to stay away from anything out of a box. Uh, the dairy, you get a pad of butter a day, which is very difficult up here in the great dairy land we live in. But you can find low-fat yogurts, low-fat milks, things like that. So it's 10 do's, 4 don'ts. And I, we tell patients try to migrate to that over a couple of years because we're humans. We've done this for decades, and we can't just snap our fingers and say, tomorrow I'm going to eat this way. I like the concept of, of nudge, where you're not, or like the Mark Twainism, where you, you uh, can't throw bad habits out the window. You have to coax them down the stairs one at a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's easy for us, our patients, our families, to get overwhelmed by these dietary recommendations and, mm -hmm. and just give up, you know. And to me, if you just nudge yourself, have, have a fish one more day a week, and maybe when you go to the grocery store, don't go hungry and don't be picking up some of those snack foods. Mm -hmm. The whole concept of snacking, in a way, is sort of contrary to the way evolution occurred in terms of, of mm -hmm. not people really don't need to eat as many times a day as they do. Mm -hmm. So if you just stop snacking or if you're working on something, an unconscious eating where you're, you're working away and you're just, before you know it, you've gone through 400, 500 calories of some snack, that is just something that is potentially, you can nudge yourself not to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, the uh, desertification of breakfast, I think, has been a real problem in this country. And the other thing is tell people to have the, have the meat, have the beef. You know, if you go to a restaurant and they bring you a three-ounce steak, you're calling the manager over and say, what is this thing, you know? But cut a part of it out and fill it with beans or something, or something that's a little more healthy to eat, and eat the rest of it later. And to, the, to your point about the desertification of our foods, yeah, yeah. I had a patient recently ask me, well, how much sugar am I allowed to have? Are there any specific guidelines there? Yeah, well, that's a good question. It's, uh, I'll ask patients then, how much are you eating now? And they have no idea, absolutely no idea. 
And so that's why we have to talk to them more about fruits, vegetables, meats, dairy, things they can understand and see on a plate. But you see something on a plate, you don't know how much sugar, how much protein, how many calories. It's true, although when you're doing something like buying yogurt at the grocery store, I'll, I'll pick up four different yogurts and I'll just sort of look at the carbohydrate content and, and, the, and the calorie content and just think about it. Is this yogurt really going to taste that much different from this one? And this one has tremendously less sugar and fewer calories. I'm going to take that one. And yeah. so sometimes it's not about trying to add the whole thing up and remember where you're supposed to be in terms of the total day, but making choices between two relatively comparable foods, one of which is clearly healthier than the other. Absolutely. Now, uh, one final question is statins. Does a statin negate what you eat yeah. each day? Dr. France, do you have any thoughts? Uh, I, I think there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, I, I, I think that it, it's this it, sort of natural, I suppose, to say, well, I don't want to deal with all that diet business. Just give me a statin, and when my blood pressure goes up because I'm eating way too much salt, um, give me something for my blood pressure, and when my blood sugar goes up and I'm diabetic, give me something for my diabetes, but it doesn't work that way exactly, does it? Unfortunately, it doesn't. The studies have actually shown that if you take a statin and you're not eating healthy, as, uh, as assessed by the Modified Healthy Eating Index, which is basically the Mediterranean, that the 40% of people that are eating the unhealthy uh, actually get no benefit of the statin at all. I mean, no reduction in their cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, which is really amazing, 40%. And the other thing is fitness. If you're uh, not fit, but you are taking a statin, your benefit is negated also. That all the benefit is really in the ones that are fit, meaning they can go to a certain workload on a treadmill or do certain activities uh, to keep themselves in good cardiovascular fitness. So statin does not negate diet, does not negate fitness, does not negate lifestyle, unfortunately. And I think we have these concepts and devices that can help us now with this, right, in terms of this whole uh, combination of both being more active, uh, the, the Fitbit type things or other uh, activity monitoring sensors that kind of nudge us a little bit and say, gosh, you really aren't doing as much as you thought you were. Um, so that combination of increasing the activity levels to what would be more traditional as, as in evolution um, and being more cautious with our dietary choices and for the right patients, of course, statins and other lipid-lowering therapies can be of, of enormous value, and they, they can be extremely important, especially for patients who have familial hyperlipidemias and things where even with diet, they can't achieve the goals that would really minimize their cardiovascular mm -hmm. risk. So, but I, I think it's, it's the whole package, and, and I, I, I like to remind myself of the expression that you're your, your body is a temple, don't desecrate the temple. I mean, it, it matters what you do to your body. And, and if we can just think a little bit more about that every day, I think we can be healthier. Mm -hmm. Great, well, this was a fantastic discussion. Thank you, Dr. France, thank you, Dr. Kopetsky. And thank you for joining us on theheart.org on Medscape.